Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jane C, as I was introduced, and I am an artist. And growing up, I've always loved to draw faces. I draw faces all day, every day. And But while I was drawing faces, I was so immersed in drawing a perfect face that I never questioned what factors determined to me what a perfect face was. And then about two summers ago, maybe three, I was a freshman a long time ago, I was studying abroad in Oxford and was deciding to take a weekend trip to London. And while I was on the bus, the lady sitting next to me is actually an art professor in the vicinity. And we talk about art, the conversation seems to be going well, and then I show her some of my work and the faces. And she stares and she looks at me and says, why do all your faces look the same? You know, why are they all of, you know, white women who look like they're beautiful models? And I really didn't know how to answer that question, and so it was just an awkward long ride the rest of the way to <laughs> London. <laughs> and then, you know, I came back to the U.S., came back to resume my studies, and sort of put that question in the back of my mind until I took a race aesthetics and analytical class, and my professor asked me the exact same question, and this time the scientist in me emerged and tried to find the source of my bias toward this one type of beauty and how I could change that. So, going back, growing up, I've always loved magazines. I've collected Vogue since the 2000 millennial issue. Every time I go to a different country, I buy so many magazines that it almost exceeds the 50 pound luggage <laughs> limit. And, you know, you look at all these covers, they're all beautiful women, but they all share that same type of look and features. And even the Huffington Post reports that in 2015, 80.2% of models cast for the cover were of white. And then I go back to my education as an artist and growing up from elementary school, middle school and onwards, there was this emphasis on Western art. And in these beautiful paintings by Da Vinci, Renoir, Vermeer, there's always this emphasis on white beauty as the ideal subject to portray in the art world. And lastly, even in my own Asian community, every time I visit my grandma, she always had these whitening skin kits for me saying that oh, Jane, you just put this on every day and night, and in two months, you'll be as beautiful as a pale supermodel. And, you know, I, it, it was a lot of pressure, and it wasn't only me. You know, even The New Yorker estimates that anywhere from one-fifth to one-third of women in Asia undergo the knife for cosmetic reasons to gain more Western features. Some examples I know personally are high nose bridges, double eyelids, and, you know, skin creams to whiten the skin. So just to look like these Chinese and Asian celebrities you see here. You know, and all these influences resulted in me in creating a painting with a face that looks like this. This is a very good example of a lot of the faces I drew growing up. And although I think all of these faces are lovely, what is wrong with this? None of these faces look like me, the people around me, or any of you guys in this audience. And from this, I realized not only was my work lacking diversity, it was also lacking an appreciation of the people I see every day. And so going back, I made this hypothesis that I looked and thought, okay, what I grew up with shaped the artwork I made and the beauty ideals instilled in me. And the way I wanted to change it was, look at the people around me, look at photography of other cultures and races and draw them and practice my hand at them in order to expand my aesthetic values to people of all color. So this sort of experiment started about a summer ago. I was in Shanghai, China, it's a little selfie of me in the bustling streets there. And next to it, I put an example of my default white ideal face just for comparison. And I was shadowing in a Chinese hospital and a nurse asked me, hey Jane, can you, draw a picture of me, and I thought, no big deal, faces are my thing, I love to draw faces. And I sit down, I draw an oval, and then from that point on, things get harder. I draw her eyelids incorrectly, I make her nose bridge too high and too western, and I can't get the pigmentation of her skin correct with the colored pencils I have. And so I realize it's hard for me to draw people of color because my hand is so practiced in drawing supermodel western faces. But, you know, through practice, I keep pushing myself to actively ask people around me to let me draw them, reading more papers on analytical aesthetics as it concerns race. And, you know, over time, I've been so in love with this subject that I've been given the opportunity to curate a show on this particular subject. And by curatorship, I mean 
I challenge artists in this community out of state or one even out of country to draw people of color and to write down the challenges associated with it. And this March, we'll all put it into a gallery space and exhibit these the awesome works and thoughts that these artists have had about it. And in my own development as an artist, I've been really happy to see how I've learned to appreciate the aesthetic quality of all kinds of people and of people around me and how my art has just become more interesting to me overall. And I just have so much fun looking at people's faces and thinking, I want to draw this face too. And so as you can see from all of this, what we grow up with and what forms the basic building blocks of our understanding really shapes the way we think, how we perceive others and ourselves, and you know, for me, how I create what I do create and how we all create you know, work. And so I think that from this, it is so important for us to go back to these building blocks and to question them, to analyze what is feeding into the way we form our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. And I think by doing so, we can all make a 180 in the way we think and life will become not only more interesting, but more colorful as well. Thank you.